heard the talk and uh, going to get a sermon from uh, Professor Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> We're not your typical Christians. <laughs> and we embrace that. We really do. You know, there's, there's some tough things that we have to learn from God sometimes. How many of you guys remember where you were and what you were doing when the World Trade Centers came down on September 11, 2001? I do. I was getting ready for work. We are coming up about a week and a half away from the 11th anniversary of that event. And I don't know about you, but it's fresh in my mind. My son was a year old, and I was thinking, what's the world going to be like when he grows up? Due to the actions of some very evil people, almost 3,000 people lost their life on that day. And they probably, many of them, had time to realize their fates. The people on the top of the tower after the planes hit, the people that you know were on the plane that went down in Pennsylvania, they had time. Now here's a hard question. Do you think they were asking, where's God? Do you think they prayed? Did they ask for safety and for rescue? And yes, there are tons of stories of miracles and hope that come out of that event. But not everyone had their prayers answered. We have tragedy and hardship all around us nowadays. You guys remember just a couple of months ago, um, James Holmes in Colorado, opening of Dark Knight Returns, an event that with our interest, just about any one of us could have been at a midnight showing. Probably, I bet you, a lot of you guys were at a midnight showing of that movie. Um, Twelve people died. Fifty-eight people were wounded. Do you think that they prayed? Where's God? How many of you guys have had health problems going on for way longer than they should have? How many of you guys need a job? How many people are so lonely and desperate for that special someone, yet they find themselves lonely? How many of you guys are struggling with finances? <laughs> How many of us have problems? Don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> now, I know that we pray for ourselves and we pray for others. We ask God to help and to solve these problems. And we have confidence in that. But he doesn't always answer those things, does he? I mean, what's up with that? Why does God take so long sometimes to answer our prayers, if at all? And it's really interesting because there are so many passages in the Bible that say God will answer prayers. I want to read a few of them. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. I think most of you guys have heard this. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which one of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good to gifts to those who ask him. Good gifts, but why don't we always get them? Another passage. This is from uh, Mark chapter 11. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go and throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. How many of us have prayed and believed for financial improvement, for spiritual improvement, for relationship improvement, and it doesn't always happen? 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have, that we have what we ask of him. Whatever we ask, we're supposed to get. But we know that doesn't happen all the time. That's a hard truth, isn't it? And that's one of the things that non-Christians will sometimes bring up. Well, God doesn't answer all your prayers. And it's something that gives Christians pause and doubt sometimes. 
has him to think, why is he not listening? I assume we have a few Harry Potter fans in here. <laughs> yes, I have my wand with me. We, my wife and I and the kids, we play role-playing games also. Um, one of our favorite games, it's an older game, it's been out of print for a long time, Changeling the Dreaming. I don't know if you guys ever played that. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. Yes! You can use the hands. One of the, the cantrips, the magic spells in there, is called Flicker Flash. And basically, it's this instantaneous teleportation. It allows you to go to teleport anyone or anything from one place to another, no matter what the distance. When we have been driving on long car trips, don't you think we wanted to be able to go flicker flash and poof, <laughs> we are there. In Harry Potter, we've got the summoning charm, Accio. And you cast that spell for those of you who are like behind the times. I came to Harry Potter World late, so I'm just not condemning anyone. Um, uh, in fact, Deathly Hallows is the first one I actually saw in theaters. Um, but you, you cast the spell, Accio, and something whoosh rushes right to you. Probably the most famous example of that is in the Goblet of Fire, when Harry's going through the Triwizard Tournament, and Hermione teaches him this. And Harry uses it when he is going through the first challenge and he's battling the dragon. For those of you who haven't seen the movie, like there's probably two people in here, um, <laughs> or haven't read the book, uh, he has to get a golden egg from a dragon, a Hungarian horntail, and this is the nastiest of the dragons that they have chosen. And Harry doesn't really have the strength necessarily to defeat it. And he gets almost scorched, beaten, bruised. Those spikes come down, shatter rock near him. He gets almost killed so many times. And then towards the end, he takes out his wand, goes, Accio Firebolt. And with a flick and a swish, did I do that right? Flick and swish. Uh, his room rushes to him. He gets on it. He's able to use his strengths, his room skills, to evade the dragon, get the egg, and win the challenge. Now, wouldn't it be nice if that was how prayer worked? We're facing the dragons in life, and the dragons in life, and they are kicking our tushies. We are getting beat up. We're bruised, bloodied, burned. We don't know how we're going to get through this. And all of a sudden, we say, "Wait." I have my magic wand. And I'm going to go, Accio God. <laughs> and then poof, God is there, and our problem is restored. It's resolved. Now, when we put it that way, that sounds a little bit silly, doesn't it? But isn't that what we're kind of expecting? We can't just summon God. And I really don't think when we think about it, any reasonable Christian would think that we could. But then we get upset or disappointed about unanswered prayers. It's interesting, though, because we're not the only ones. I want to take a long look at the story of Lazarus in uh, John chapter 11. Um, this is really telling in this. I'm going to skip some of the passages, but I'm going to read a whole bunch of it. So starting at the beginning. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his, her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. Okay, those of you who know the story, didn't Lazarus kind of die? <laughs> um, no, it is for God's glory that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now, notice how many times in here Jesus loves these people. You know, uh, the sister said, the one you love is sick. The Bible says here Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he rushed right out there and helped him. Um, no. In uh, uh, verse 7, it says, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Think about that. Then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Okay, so let's get this straight. One of Jesus' really good friends is laying sick and dying. And rather than rushing off, he waits another two days before traveling. 
And we know from the Bible, Jesus healed several people without even being there. He would he said to the Roman soldier, go, your daughter's healed. And by the time the soldier got back to his house, he was healed. But he didn't do that. Why? On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. You know, Jesus left right away. Lazarus had still been in the tomb for a couple of days. But he was in there for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Do you think that Martha and Mary prayed for their brother? Do you think that they wanted him healed? They knew a miracle worker. This was after the whole thing with washing his uh, feet with her hair. They knew who he was. They knew he could heal. They knew what he could do. And their prayer went unanswered. Personal friends with the Messiah, be Christ himself, he couldn't bother to answer their prayer? How do you think they felt about prayer? Verse 28. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she quickly got up and went to him. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Have we done that? I mean, Mary and Martha were both upset. If only Jesus had come on time. If only he had done what they asked. Everything would be okay. God, if only you had given me that job, I, I wouldn't be behind on my bills. God, if only you hadn't let me get into that accident. Lord, if only that person, my family member, hadn't gotten cancer. Lord, if only my faith wasn't so shaky. We've done the same thing. When Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Here's where I think this is interesting. Jesus was crying. He was upset. See, he, his friend was dead. But he knew it was going to happen. He was sad seeing the other people cry, the other people upset. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? He was crying. Oh, he misses him. But some of them said, verse 37, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? There were doubters then also. Others wondered, well, if he could do all these great things, why didn't he stop Lazarus from dying? I mean, healing a blind man is easy. Why couldn't he have kept him from dying? If he is so great and powerful, why doesn't he answer prayer? Just yesterday, um, we had a guy stop by uh, the fan table. And uh, we were talking for a little bit, and very quickly, and at first I couldn't have a good conversation with him. If, we, if you haven't been to the fan table, you're right next to literally the fans. They put that down in the fan area now, so I was having a hard time hearing him. He was having a hard time hearing me. But he was talking about, you know, if... Our God is so big and so great. Shouldn't he give special revelation to each and every person? Why do we need to be telling people about him? Why do we need to be um, you know, talking to people about him? Why do we need to bother getting together? God can have that because he's so big and powerful. And if we need to do that, how powerful is he really? And as he was walking away, Paul had actually given him one of our cards to begin the conversation. He tore it up in front of us and threw it in the trash can. There are people that wonder, if God is so big and so great, why hasn't he done X, Y, and Z? And I bet you that most of us, if not all of us in the room, myself included, have wondered that same thing. Verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sisters of the dead man, by this time, there's a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Okay, i got to stop right here. Martha's the practical one. She's the one who, while Mary was, you know, doting all over Jesus, was like, uh, hello, come help me with the meal and the dishes. And so here we have the Messiah. He's doing all these things. He's like, big and dramatic, roll away the stone. Lord, did he come stink? 
Okay, Martha sometimes gets too, gets too caught up in the details, don't we sometimes? And I think that's a great example of that. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Think about that. What was the bigger miracle? Healing Lazarus or raising him from the dead? which showed the glory of God in a bigger way, healing or resurrection. The Bible contains so many promises from God that he will hear us and that he will answer our prayers. So why does it seem like sometimes he doesn't? Three main points. First of all, God's not a genie. We don't rub the lamp, wave our wand, speak the magic words, and boom, he's immediately going to show up. If he responded to us like that, then any miracles would be because of our power and our ability. He would be answering our commands, not us following his. If we said, Akio God, and he appeared, then he would be our servant. That's not who he is. Not how he works. He is our Lord and we are his servants. We answer to and we follow him. Not the other way around. Now, he loves us. He loves us more than we can realize. And he will take care of us. And he is not at our beck and call. We need to stop being arrogant sometimes. And we need to ask we do for him, not what he can do for us. Second, God knows the consequences of answering prayers, both good and bad. When we pray for something, we may not know what the future is going to hold and what the consequence of that prayer is going to be. Let's say that we have a loved one that has terminal cancer. My mom died of cancer, so I know what that's like. Um, we pray for their healing. And then they die. It's an unanswered prayer. But what if during that time, through that tragedy of that death, someone was so broken and so upset that they turned to God in their moment of tragedy and sorrow and they became closer to Him? What about praying for a promotion? Praying for more money in your job? Praying for a different job? Trust me, I like that. I'm actually in an opportunity right now where that may happen. But what if, answering that prayer, you would be away from your family more? You would have less time to spend with friends and family. And what if, on business trips, you were open to temptation? And you sinned. You fell. God would have answered that prayer, but what are the consequences? Some of you guys know this, some of you guys don't. Um, first of all, for those who don't know us very well, um, the purple haired Tonks uh, that was up here, uh, that's my wife Stacy. Um, so yes, we've been in Tonks. Um, I, she was not the first woman I was engaged to. I'm not the first guy she was engaged to. Both of us had previous relationships. My relationship ended bad, and I was with her for four years. At the time, I was not a Christian. But I was wondering, why is all of this happening? Now, I was as much at fault as that woman was, so I can't lay the blame at her feet. I had my share. But because of that, because of that failure of a relationship, that failure of marriage, someone that, when I first proposed, I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life with her. And that fell apart in a bad way. But because of that, I became saved as a direct result of how that relationship ended. Because of getting saved, I ended up with a woman that I'm more in love with now 14 years later than I was back then. Because of the way that relationship ended, 
I ended up in ministry and came to Christ, and I'm standing here before you guys today. God knew the consequence, the good consequence, of not answering that prayer and where that would lead me. For those of you who are country music fans, you might know the old Garth Brooks song, Sometimes I Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. Sometimes that unanswered prayer will have a much better outcome than if God answered it. We can't see that. But you can. Third thing. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayer because he wants to do something even bigger and even better. What would have happened if God had answered Mary and Martha's prayer and healed Lazarus? How many people did he heal? A lot. And I'm sure that they were grateful, and those are wonderful miracles we should never forget. Even to this day, God still heals. But how much bigger was it for him to let Lazarus die and then bring him back to life? When God doesn't answer your immediate prayer, look for something bigger. Look for something better. He wants to do that. He wants to show up late. There's a, a Southern uh, Gospel song, Stacey almost sang, Four Days Late, if those of you are really into Southern Gospel, you might know that, about the, the story of Lazarus. You know, and the refrain is, he's four days late, but he's always on time. And he is. It's a very th scary thing to think of when we're going through that moment. But think about how much greater God is at those bigger moments. And the last really quick thing, God never necessarily said he would give us what we wanted, but he always gives us what we need. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us this day our daily bread. It doesn't say give us our weekly bread or monthly bread or yearly bread. Give us what we need today. Give us what we need to survive today. Unanswered prayers are tough. But there's a reason for them. Let me make this very clear. God loves you. And he never breaks a promise. So if you're praying hard for something and the answer doesn't come right away, don't give up. He has heard you. Make your heart right. Open yourself up to him. Submit to him. Give yourself to him. Seek him with all of your heart, your mind, and your soul. Wait on him, realizing that he's going to give you not what you want, but what you need. And if you keep waiting, do so in glorious anticipation that God didn't answer that small prayer, because he's going to answer it in a bigger way. God is great. Father, we love you. And Lord, it's so hard to go through those times when it seems like you're not there. You're not answering back, so we think you don't hear us, but you do hear us. And you weep. Jesus wept when he saw everyone crying at the sorrow of Lazarus. And Lord, when you see us weeping and crying over our sorrows, you weep also. But then Jesus did something even better than you. We trust you. We love you. We are going to put our faith in you for all of those reasons. Help us to understand you and become closer to you so that we can serve you, so that we can be yours, so that we can wait on you. We love you.